I think we're ready to go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, it's morning for me. It's probably afternoon for you. I'm out in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, beautiful day out here. I hope you're having a good day back in Philly. Uh, I think where most of you are. And today I'm going to be talking about creating desktop applications that have web UIs. Um, and we'll talk about you know, how we do this and, and why you might want to do this. A lot of us still have to build desktop applications. So, uh, you know, instead of learning WPF or a framework for WPF or Xamarin or something else, uh, why can't we just use HTML and CSS and JavaScript and the things that we know to build a UI on the desktop just like we build it on the web? Um, and so that's kind of what this is about. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek of a project that uh, I'm involved with, an open source project that was started by Steve Sanderson over at Microsoft now. Uh, you might know Steve. He invented Knockout JS and a few other things. So um, really smart guy, been around for a while. And he put this open source project together and then got really involved with the Xamarin team over at Microsoft. Um, and uh, got really busy with what he was doing. So he said, you know, I just, I really can't uh, keep this up. And we got interested in the project and uh, started working with it. So let me just get started with a few things here. Um, first off, uh, I work for Code, and uh, that's a, a company that puts out a magazine. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's mostly .NET, but not all .NET. Uh, we started off as a Microsoft magazine, Microsoft-centric, and now we do all kinds of technology, although we're still pretty heavy on the Microsoft side. So we want to offer you all a free digital subscription. So if you'll uh, look this URL here on the slide, oops, sorry about that, uh, codemag.com slash subscribe slash PCC, that's Philly Code Camp 21. Uh, you can get a six month free digital subscription and uh, hopefully get a little bit more uh, knowledge out of that. So a lot of really good things in there, some really interesting articles, everything from quantum, quantum computing to .NET 5. We did a special issue, uh, Code Focus issue on uh, .NET 5 and its release, uh, a lot of Blazor stuff in there. So uh, please go ahead and take advantage of that. Uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Mike Yeager, and I'm a senior developer and a manager. I'm actually the uh, CEO at this point of EPS Software and Code, and uh, EPS Software is now being rebranded as Code Consulting, so we're part of the Code umbrella. Uh, I've been writing and speaking for years worked on Visual Studio extensibility. Uh, I was one of the early members on the uh, Microsoft Azure team. So we did strategic design review meetings uh, up in Washington on just the entire Azure platform at that time, which was uh, fairly small. Uh, I'm a contributor to the code framework, which Marcus Egger, my boss uh, and our owner, created a framework for .NET and now a framework for .NET Core and .NET 5 going forward. Uh, there was a WPF framework, uh, which is a, a really great framework. It gives you a, a good hand on doing w, handle on doing WPF applications. Uh, and there's also a framework for services. It makes you uh, create your services in a way so that they can be reused with different protocols, different endpoints, so you can expose things as REST and WCF, for example, um, and uh, gRPC, and without changing your source code. So you can expose it in different ways without rewriting it for uh, each platform like you have to do now. So uh, worked on that. And then Fotino, which is what I want to talk to you about. Uh, it was codenamed West, W-E-S-T, and now we have a final name. Uh, it's called Fotino, and uh, Otto Dobertsberger from EPS and myself have been working on this. Um, and the original project was called Web Window uh, from Steve Sanderson. And uh, so now it's going to be rebranded as Fotino, and we should have a launch pretty soon. 
so what do we do at Code Magazine and EPS Software? Our whole thing is just helping people build better software. So um, we uh, we do all kinds of work. We've got consulting, we've got training, uh, we do staffing, and then of course we have the magazine. So just a lot of resources for you to uh, to work with. So let's get to it. Um, I'm going to talk about what is Fotino. Um, again, what was formerly called Web Window, if you've heard of that. Uh, we'll do some demonstrations. We'll look at some sample applications, and then I'll show you what's coming next, uh, what's going to be in the launch, and what we're looking at uh, after that. So Fotino, according to Wikipedia, is a hypothetical subatomic particle. It's the super partner of the photon uh, predicted by supersymmetry. So this is like all very Sheldon Cooper-ish. Um, <laughs> but the interesting part of this is that uh, even though it's theoretical at this point and it's never been observed, it is the lightest supersymmetric particle in the universe. Um, and lightweight was one of the key factors of uh, design in this. So to make things uh, lightweight, fast, easy to download, uh, we thought that was uh, pretty fitting. So in our terms, a Fotino is an open source project based on Steve Sanderson's web window. And that was done with .NET Core and a pre-release version of the WebView 2 control. Uh, so the WebView 2 if you haven't heard of it, is sort of uh, it's just a browser control that you can put in other applications uh, on Windows. There used to be an IE control that you could put in, and for years that's all we had. Uh, even after IE was sort of deprecated, so WebView 2 is the edge browser now in a web control, and you can pop that into uh, your applications. And Steve's a really bright guy. You might want to check out his blog post on this. <coughs> Uh, you can either do it from the URL here or just uh, do a search for Steve Sanderson web window and you'll find his blog post in his GitHub repository, the original. Um, so what that was, was this insight where he said, well, you know what I can do now that we have this web control is that I can in .NET open up a window um, or I can I can actually in C++ create a window, a native window on the Windows platform, and I can put an edge control in it and fill the entire thing with an edge control. And then uh, I can call that from my .NET application. And that way I've got, you know, basically a native window with a web browser running in it uh, with the entire edge web browser. Uh, without all the Chrome, it's just in a, a Windows window. And then he thought, well, you know what? Uh, if I'm running this on Linux or Mac, I can use their sort of built-in or, or default web controls and do the same thing. I can open up a window and I can put a web control in there. And then we can serve web content and that could be the UI. So uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth, but uh, pretty brilliant piece of thinking on, on Steve's part. Um, and what do you end up with? Uh, if you've heard of Electron, um, Electron is this technology that allows you to run web applications in uh, a desktop environment. And there's a lot of apps built on Electron, Visual Studio Code, Slack, Postman, Evernote, WordPress, Microsoft Teams itself. Um, you notice all these applications have this little menu bar on the left side um, that's provided and they all sort of have that same sort of menu and the menu can be pulled out or uh, pushed back in again. But then everything else inside that frame is all HTML. So everything's running. Uh, the UI was designed with HTML. The nice thing about that is that it renders pretty much the same on all these platforms. Um, and so what they did with Electron was they said, we're going to package up the Chromium engine and we're going to package up Node.js and we're going to let people um, build their web applications, their web UIs, and package them in a desktop application and it'll work across all these different desktop platforms. Um, so 
a pretty smart thing, and this is kind of what Steve was thinking as well, except when you use Electron, your back end is basically Node.js, and when you install an Electron app, it downloads and installs Node.js on your machine, uh, and all of your, what we're, we'll call back end or native stuff, runs inside that Node.js runtime. And then it fires up a window, um, and it's a, a native window for the platform that you're on. So if you're on Linux, it fires up a, a Linux window, and it puts a Chromium browser control in there and connects the two and allows you to have that web UI with the Node.js back end. And it's basically HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And, you know, that's uh, – it's – obviously done really well. There's a lot of applications out there that do it. WhatsApp, uh, Teams, as we said, that we're all using right now. So uh, it works great. And if you look at these apps and if you've tried them on a Mac and you've tried them on Windows and tried them on Linux, they all look very much the same. Um, and they can make use of all of the things local on a desktop that you need. So you've got things like printer access and access to special hardware and access to um, file system and all the things you can't really do with uh, the web. And, and if you're building a desktop app, a lot of times those are the reasons that you want to build a desktop app instead of a web app is because you need access to all that stuff or you need it to work offline so that, uh, you know, you go on a plane and you've still got an application. And this is one way of doing it. So you've got an installed application, uh, all of your web pages, all your CSS, your HTML, your JavaScript is packaged up and it's part of the application. So it's downloaded and, and runs on the local machine. So you don't need a network connection to run it. Now, if you're using network resources, um, obviously you need a network connection to do that. So if you're connecting to a database somewhere, so if you want to build in offline mode, you still have to do things like have a local database, but you can install you know, SQL Server, for example. You don't have to install some database that's going to work in a browser. Um, so you have access to everything that's on the platform. So Fotino, you can kind of think of it as Electron, except instead of Node.js as the back end, for us, we're going to have .NET as the back end, so we can use all the goodies in .NET, and it doesn't have to download Node.js. Um, now, you do need the .NET runtime, so if the .NET runtime is installed on the machine already, that's great. That means your applications, the whole download package is basically going to be uh, a couple of K of stuff from us that's going to be, you know, the, the shell, this uh, C++ thing that creates the window, very small, and it's going to be your application. So we're talking, you know, kilobytes or megabytes. Uh, if they don't have it installed and you want to do this and make sure that it runs everywhere, whether or not they have the framework installed, then you can include the framework in there and that makes it a little bit bigger. Um, but these installs, we said lightweight was the thing that they were going for and the Fotino is the most lightweight particle. So uh, these things can actually be very small, and I'll show you a, a slide about that later. So let's get into how this thing works. Um, Steve basically wrote the, the first part of this, uh, what we're calling Fotino native. Uh, he called web window native. That's the C++ or the objective C part. So he wrote some generic C code that compiles in C++. It compiles in Objective-C, so we can compile it for, um, and, and we do, we have a continuous integration build set up that every time we check in a change to this C++ code, uh, it goes and builds a new executable. And that is the wrapper around, uh, on Windows, it's gonna be the uh, edge control. So almost all Windows 10 installations have Edge. And if they don't, and this is uh, a feature that we haven't quite added yet, um, but it'll go ahead and download it for you and in include that as well. Um, but most of the time it's already there, so we don't need to download it, unlike the way that uh, Chromium 
needs to be downloaded every time to install uh, a uh, Electron app. So if you're on Windows, uh, you've got the edge control. And if you're on Mac, then you're going to have uh, basically, or Linux, you're going to have basically a web kit. So there's a web kit that's sort of specially designed for um, Safari that Mac has installed by default, so it's always going to be there. Uh, never really need to download that. And then on Linux, you have that plus the GTK, uh, which is that little symbol at the bottom. So C++ code, you know, the kind of stuff that geeks write, very uh, cross-platform compatible C++ code, so it's very um, plain vanilla. And it's very small and it compiles down and basically it, it mostly just expects that one of these things is going to be there depending on the platform you're on. So we compile this for each platform, one for Windows, one for Mac, one for Linux, and then we package everything up into a NuGet package. And then we use that NuGet package uh, and we'll see this diagram a little bit later on again. And we'll see how we kind of build on this control. So this is a very uh, low level control. And uh, it's uh, again written in C, uh, very tiny. And it allows us to pull up a window. So it gives us that. And uh, one of the things that it gives us is a native window. And that window pulls up. And then we have it loading a browser control appropriate. So these are all WebKit and uh, Chromium browser engines. So they all render pretty much the same. Um, and this is the uh, the breakdown of that. So it's a wrapper around the OS's built-in WebKit or Chromium browser control uh, that opens a native window on the desktop with the browser control loaded in it. Uh, and so uh, we package this all up as a NuGet package. Most of us are never going to have to really think much more about this. Um, in fact, uh, most of us are going to look a little bit farther down the line and uh, use some already pre-built stuff. So we talked about it's lightweight because the browser control is usually installed. We only have to install the wrapper. Um, also, if .NET is already installed, we don't have to download that. So uh, we built all this on .NET 5. Uh, we haven't gone back and looked at uh, .NET 3.1 support again. Uh, we may go ahead and do that. We'll have to build a separate version for 3.1 if there's a lot of call for that. But we're thinking .NET 5 has been out for a while. Uh, and it seems to be adopted pretty quickly. And it does make a few things a bit easier. Um, it's cross-platform because applications communicate with the wrapper uh, in the same way on any OS. So we have this OS or uh, calls into basically a, a DLL uh, or the Mac version of a DLL or the Linux version of a DLL. Um, and, uh, you know, it's this consistent access to it. So when you have something like .NET 5, you can have one code base and it interacts with this control um, uh, the same way across all these different operating systems. So um, if you're thinking about this, and I know, I know we're going, uh, we've still got a lot of background here. Um, we haven't gotten into the fun stuff yet, but um, if you think about this, the Fotino.native, that C++ project, it's got its own GitHub a repository, its own CI CD build and release pipelines, its own NuGet package. Um, it's not just a .NET thing. So if you wanted to use it to put UIs on C++, for example, then you could build a little library that makes this available easily to C++, um, which is horrible for writing UIs in. Or Go, or Rust, or Java, or Objective-C, or you know, any of these different things. So one of the reasons that we separated this part out um, was that it's something that could be reused, this ability to load up a window, load a native web control into it, and 
make UI and have communication between that and uh, the applications. So if you wanted to build a C++ wrapper, you'd have to do a few basic things to allow communications between the two. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. It's a, a pretty fixed API. So that brings us to the cool part. Um, this is why we're all here. Uh, we're .NET people and we want to do .NET stuff. So we have this .NET native control that does all this stuff. So one of the parts that we've taken care of is we built that wrapper for .NET. So we've got this wrapper that uh, sits in there um, in a, a NuGet package. So you can just download this Fotino.net NuGet package, and now you can start building apps on .NET. We've put everything into it that you need. Um, so you install the NuGet package, and then you make a couple of calls in your program file, and it just starts running. <coughs> so here's what it looks like. Um, so we've got Fotino native control is basically inside this window. So if you look at the front window, it says migrate app on the title bar. That's a native uh, Windows window in this case. Um, on a Mac, it'll be a, a native Mac window. On Linux, a native Linux window. And everything inside of that right now is the browser control. Now we don't have uh, the menu showing on the left side like we'll see in a lot of the um, Electron apps, and that's going to be an option to turn that menu on and off, uh, whether you want it or not. So basically, at this point, we just wrote a little UI. We wrote uh, a tiny little page, and uh, you know that's sort of the hello world example. And you can see behind it is the console window. So I don't have that hidden, which is nice for debugging because you can put debug information just out to the console. Uh, for all of the C sharp running in the background, so all the non UI stuff. So it's this hello world app exe, that console app in the background, that's actually called this uh, window, the, uh, the Fotino.net native window, and pulled it up on the screen. So normally you would hide that executable so that the whole app appeared to be the UI window. Um, but this is just to kind of show that they're they're both there. So what can you build with this? Um, you know, how restricted are you? Well, it's it's basically the entire edge browser. Um, or if you're looking at uh, Mac, it's the Safari browser, which is WebKit. Um, or it's the uh, WebKit uh, plus the uh, GTK stuff on Linux. So you've got these. Uh, very capable, very modern, usually auto updating browsers. And you can do whatever you want in them. HTML, JavaScript, CSS, it's all there. You can use React, you can use Vue, which is our favorite, um, Angular, whatever framework you want to use. Uh, it's not limited. And you have the .NET 5 back end. So you can do all your full C sharp stuff in it. <coughs> Well, then the next step is, OK, we can do all this JavaScript stuff. Great. What's even better than that? Um, Blazor. So we added the Blazor stuff, and it uses the Fotino.net NuGet package. So we take that, all the stuff that we had built in there, all the JavaScript, CSS, HTML stuff, and we added Blazor components. And we updated the communications for uh, Blazor, so that you can do all the cool Blazor stuff. Uh, so turn that into a NuGet package. Now you have a, a choice. You can say, I just want to use regular web stuff. I want to build a Vue app, for example, or uh, an Angular app or React app for my UI. And I have communication channels set up with my back end, so I can access the file system and, and do all those things. Um, uh, access SQL Server, all the stuff that you might want to do um, that you might normally do in a service. Um, you know, you you can all that available to you, but your UI is not some technology that's you know only a Windows technology or uh, only a, a Xam. You know, every time you do a different 
I, you've got to learn basically a different UI. Um, can you please message the URL here? Uh, actually, this whole slide deck, I wanted to mention that uh, it's been uploaded. So if you uh, go to the file section in Code Camp um, under the Saturday, uh, you can get this slide deck and download it. And uh, the URL for Fotino is not, uh, it's not available right now. We're, we're currently putting together the website and the documentation. Uh, the GitHub repository is currently private, uh, as well as the DevOps uh, stuff for the pipelines. So we're using um, GitHub for the source control. That's where all the source code is going to be. Um, and then we're using DevOps to build uh, for Mac, for Linux, for Windows, create the NuGet package, uh, to create the Fotino.net package, to create the Fotino.net Blazor package. Uh, is there a way to use Chromium instead of Edge on Windows? Uh, so this is Chromium Edge, so it's the Edge that's built with uh, the Chromium kit. And no, right now it is uh, Edge Chromium. So you're you're basically getting Chromium uh, with some of the Edge extensions to it. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what we're limited to right now. If there turns out to be a big need to be able to use uh, just Chromium Engine uh, on its own, then we may do that. Uh, one of the reasons that we didn't is because, again, it's a download. Um, so if we wanted to use the same engine across all of them, we would have to uh, basically do what they did with Electron and make that part of, you know, which adds a little bit to it, makes it a little bit heavier, uh, makes it a little bit slower installing. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it is Chromium. It's just the the Chromium Edge. All right. Uh, so when we talk about Blazor, um, you know, we're talking about a Blazor application. So basically, you're getting Blazor in a desktop window. So this is the Hello World sample that we all see um, with some extra stuff. And I'll show you this live here in a few minutes when we get to the demos. Uh, but everything you can do in Blazor, you can do here. So now we're writing C Sharp on the front end. We're writing C Sharp in the back end. We're using all our cool web stuff, which personally, I, I was a big WPF developer, uh, did a lot of WinForms development in the past. I like web UI development. Uh, a lot of things are just a lot easier. I'm not a huge fan of JavaScript, um, <laughs> but uh, it has gotten quite a bit better. But I really like this ability to do Blazor to write C Sharp instead of JavaScript in my UIs. And I've got access to all kinds of controls. And, uh, you know, it's just I find UI development easier with web technologies than I do with, uh, you know, all the multiple UI technologies I found for native applications. So what can you build with Fotino.net Blazor? Um, basically anything. And you can do uh, some things that you can't do with standard Blazor, like you can make it a top level window. Uh, and I'll show you that in a demo a little bit later. Uh, some things that you can't do with just you know a, a browser window. You can set the initial position and size. So you can do some of the things that you can do with desktop apps that uh, you know, we sort of add that functionality and make it available to things that are in Blazor. So let's talk just a little bit more about uh, the uh, the source code and what's going on uh, with Electron, what's going on with Fotino, and then we'll get into some of the samples and the code and uh, get to play with it a little bit. So. If you're familiar with Electron, uh, how is it different from Fotino? As I said, one of the big things when this was built, when Steve looked at it, was make this thing install faster, make it smaller, make it more lightweight. So if you look at just a blank Electron app, um, you're looking about 60 megabytes um, on Windows and a little bit more on Mac and Linux. And if you're doing a Blazor, so this is Blazor. Um, this is uh, quite a lot of stuff. This is not just 
a, a web control, but it's all the Blazor stuff. So you want to download and install that? It's half the size. And you know that's including the .NET framework pieces. So quite a bit smaller because we don't have to download and install Node.js. We don't have to download and install uh, Chromium. So um, we don't have to install some of the extra things that, that we really don't need. So we're really working on lightweight. Uh, if you've already got the framework installed, then we're talking like less than a megabyte, maybe half a megabyte for just a blank application. So very fast, very small, very easy. Uh, Fotino versus Electron memory use. Um, .NET is great. Uh, it's not a memory hog. And when you look at, uh, you know, just an Electron app in Windows with Blazor, again, we're using Edge, which is a Chromium-based browser. So it's the Chromium Edge browser in Windows. So we're still using Chromium. And, you know, from 134 megabytes just to fire an Electron app up, we're down to 86 with web window and all of Blazor. So much better memory use. When you go to Mac and Linux, it gets even smaller because we've now got uh, WebKit. So WebKit is a lot less memory hungry than Chromium, the Chromium engine. So when you're on Mac and OS and using WebKit, we use even less memory because we don't have a whole lot of you know big fat browser control so that's where this really drops and you notice you know when you get down to uh, linux and this was ubuntu 1804 and it seems to be about the same in the newer version um in the 2004 uh it's maybe 20 megabytes so it's uh it's very lean and mean and Uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's it's a great starting point. So we have all this available to us. What are the downsides right now? Electron is a very mature application. They've got a lot of features built in uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, Fotino is new. Uh, it's basically we've taken the web window, we've updated it. It was originally done with some beta stuff. Um, the uh, Web View 2 control wasn't out yet. Uh, for example, so everything's been updated. We've it updated it to .NET 5. And uh, so, you know, maturity wise, we're not as quite there yet, but uh, we're still uh, in a very good position uh, as far as stability. So far, all of our testing has been very stable. So um, we're actually getting ready to launch everything into open source. So we're going to bring features to it. Uh, if one of the nice things is as a web developer are, are you know, coming forward, I, I look at this stuff and I go, you know what? I can, uh, I know how to do this. I know how to write in .NET. I know how to write web applications. Um, so I can actually add to this. So we've added a few features already. Uh, and we're continuing to add more. And, you know, it's not that tough. If you don't need to implement something in the C++ project, for example, you can do open source and work in the uh, Fotino.net area, which is all just uh, C Sharp and JavaScript and <coughs> uh, actually add features to it. So. Also, it's open source, so you can always uh, just subclass Fotino.net and add stuff to it. Do it the easy way. Uh, if you need to change some stuff in the base classes to make something work or to add some functionality that's missing, you can do that. Um, you can submit a pull request, and if it looks like something that we want to add into the, the code base, we'll accept your pull request, and um, you know, you'll have a hand in in creating what you need to develop your apps. So let's get to the demo stuff. Let's get to the fun stuff. I'm going to show you a Hello World app. This is the one we talked about before. 
um, and this is just showing you sending a message to the UI from the back end. So when this window comes up, sort of its initialization, I'm sending something to a, a hidden tag in the in the HTML. Um, so there's a tag in there that's that's marked and says, you know, here's a spot that you can direct your calls to. And I just send an alert and it says, you know, super great. Um, so that's part of the initialization. And then once it's initialized, I get the rest of the app here. And now I'm I've got this button on here and I'm going to show you again. These are just the most basic things. A call from JavaScript from the front end into the back end. So the back end says, hey, I got your message, blah. Um, and so this is sending messages uh, one direction, the other direction. And you can see that it's very fast and uh, it works great. So just to prove to you that this really is a browser control, I can pull up my dev tools and I get all the edge dev tools or you get the dev tools for whatever browser, the web crit browser if you're uh, on a, a Mac or, or Linux. Uh, so all that stuff is here and you can see that, you know, I'm not making this up. The UI really is. Is available to me, so I've got, uh, you know, I've got the console, I've got my sources, I've got all the stuff that I'm uh, used to having for for building a web application. So, if you're uh, interested in uh, this kind of thing, this is where you go and and do your troubleshooting for your UI. Uh, it should be very familiar to you. So. Uh, again, this window is in the background right now. It's not showing anything. I'll show you a version that uh, is showing some stuff, but this is great for debugging and troubleshooting um, because really, I mean, I've got two different programs going here and they're talking to one another. I've got this uh, window that's drawn from the C++ application that's got the browser control in it and it's doing its stuff and then I've got my .NET 5 in the back end and there's uh, this communication between them like we showed with this button. Uh, so if I'm doing stuff in the .NET 5 code in the background, I can show that here in the debug window. So what's this all look like? Um, well, this is my Hello World app. This is the one that we just looked at. And uh, if we look at this project, you'll see that I've got my NuGet window open here. And um, it's got installed, and this is the code name still. This is West, um, this is, so this is what will be Fotino.net. Um, but I installed this NuGet package. So I grabbed it, and you can see it here under dependencies. And there's my NuGet package, and it's it's pretty small, um, and it includes a dependency on the native control, so that C++ package. So that's all packaged up for you. All you have to do is install this one package, and then your program, the lines that count are these two lines right here. So this one says uh, window, which uh, up here we're creating a new web window. Uh, again, this is going to be Fotino. Uh, and as you create it, you have this option of uh, sending some other stuff in here. Let's not really worry about this, um, the rest of it right now. Let's just say new web window and just imagine there's a closing paren and a semicolon there. Um, so I fire that up and that gives me that uh, the handle to that window that I'm going to work with. And then I say navigate to local file. And I can navigate to uh, just some loose HTML. So I can navigate to a string. I can navigate to a local file, uh, which when I do an install, that's going to be actually installed as content. So they're going to be files on your disk. Or I can embed all these files. I can make them embedded resources and say navigate to an embedded resource. So you have a, a choice of how you want to package your stuff. Uh, if you want to be able to update your content, sometimes it's it's easier just to say, oh yeah, I just go in, uh, I'll navigate to local files, so I'll install the index file and the uh, 
image file that I'm working with. And I'll just put those as files on disk and then I can navigate to them. If I want to make a tweak to it to see how it's going to look, maybe I'll just go change that file. Or if there's an update to a file, maybe I'll just download that one file, bring it onto the machine. Um, if you want to not have them loose and have them compiled, uh, then you just make them embedded resources, navigate to the embedded resource. So that's basically it. You're saying I want to go to the index page just like you do when you start any application. You know, what's what's the page that's going to be served? And then you uh, you say wait for exit. So when they close the window, you're going to close this application. And as you just saw, if you close the console application, if it's showing, um, that's going to close because it's a child process. It's going to uh, close the whole thing down. So whichever window you close, um, if they're both showing, is going to close the whole thing. And what is index.html? It's just like any HTML page. Um, we just have a, a body section here. We didn't even include the header. We just said hello. It's a local file. We put the little Microsoft logo right uh, on the page. And you can see here how we did the call. Uh, on click, we did a call.net. And uh, that's the, the caption on the button. And I mentioned earlier that there was a hidden tag in here um, that when the window first came up, it showed that message, which was a call from the back end. Uh, this is where it called into. So there's an app colon, and that's just, a, you know, we set that up as a place to direct messages to from the back end. And we just said, you know, it's, it's something.javascript. So when we sent our alert message, and I'll switch back to the program here, um, so we had this uh, this message from the back end to the UI, and I said before, well, we'll just imagine at this point that there's a closing paren and a semicolon here. One of the things I did was I set up a schema handler. So I said, you know, app is the the scheme, so that's the tag. So if I look at here, that's app colon slash slash. So that's a scheme like HTTP colon slash slash or file colon slash slash is. Um, and then there's a delegate. So the delegate is, uh, in this case, I just set it up as a, a Lambda. Um, and it's really, you're writing a little function to handle a call, a callback, more or less. So anytime the back end wants to send something, it's going to send a URL, uh, it's going to send a content type, and then you're going to process it. Uh, and this is uh, this is an out parameter. So uh, whatever content you're going to work with. Um, so it's basically in this case, here's my alert that popped up. I said, yeah, I want to send a, an alert and this is going to be JavaScript. So my content type is text and JavaScript. And then uh, I send it as a memory stream. So I'm just basically sending these bytes as memory into the UI. And it says, oh, that's JavaScript. And where does it go? Uh, it goes right here. So that becomes the content of something JS. And then it, it works. Uh, so that's how you send messages from the back end. Uh, from the front end, we've got call.net and we're sending blah so from the ui i say you know here's my message i want to call the send message <coughs> and uh you know so what is that okay here's send message uh and again i'm just setting up a handler whenever i call that i basically here's a lambda expression uh so here's the function when that's called i get a handle to the sender I get the message that they sent me. So anytime the front end calls, it basically it's going to call this function. Um, and again, right now I just wrote it all in line as a lambda, but generally you're going to have this as a, a separate function, and that function is going to be set up to handle a lot of different types of messages. Um, so when my message is, you know, send message, I'm just going to say. I'm going to call the built-in window.send message and I'm going to say got message.message. 
So that's what this is all about. Um, I do send message blah, and that's where I get that uh, message box that pops up on the screen. OK, <clears throat> so this is all uh, fairly straightforward stuff. All of my content, I've got it set up for. Um, right now, I, I just created a www root folder and you'll notice in my program, I say uh, all my you know, my content is going to be here. So that's just a naming convention. It's like, yeah, let's put all the HTML and JavaScript and CSS that I need in this www root folder. And there's my index HTML and then there's my Microsoft logo, my image file. And uh, I can put any uh, loose HTML, CSS, JavaScript in here. If I'm doing something like Angular or Vue or I want to use Webpack, um, I can put my uh, distribution folder inside here. So typically what I'll do is uh, I'll make my source folder outside of it. I'll let my node packages and all that stuff uh, be outside of the www root folder because they don't need to be part of the content that gets published. Uh, and then when I do my build, when I do my pack, uh, I'll do that to a distribution folder inside of www root and then I'll just reference that. So that distribution folder is part of the content along with you know whatever else is in the www root folder. Uh, there's a, a comment here about are you familiar with the Cordova hybrid apps? Uh, sounds like the same idea. It is kind of a similar idea. Um, uh, very different technology, uh, but same kind of uh, output. And uh, I don't know if Cordova is actually still around. Uh, put out somewhat dunky version of web controls in the past. Microsoft is called WebView 2. Is Fotino meant to be a replacement for that? Are there things that WebView 2 can do that Fotino can't? So uh, again, Fotino actually wraps the WebView 2 control. So the WebView 2 is the browser control. What Fotino is, is something that pulls up a native window, loads the control into it, and it's cross-platform. So on Windows, it's going to load the WebView 2 control and put that browser control inside the window. On Mac and Linux, it's going to load their default uh, controls. So instead of WebView 2, it's going to use WebKit GTK for Linux, for example. Yeah, no worries. OK, um, so that's all pretty straightforward. Uh, let's take a look at another one here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this solution up. And we had an idea of. Well, let's try a, uh, a Blazor app. So let me pull up a Blazor app. And for some reason, this one tends to come up on my other screen. So let me. Pull it down here for you. That's actually one of the things that we'll be able to uh, to work out shortly. So here's my Blazor app running, and in this case, I'm not they're showing the con uh, command window uh, is debug, so I'm only getting the Blazor app window. So again, this frame is the uh, Fotino calling up a window, and because I'm on Windows, it's stuffing the uh, edge control in here, the WebView 2. And all this is a Blazor app running in that WebView 2 control. So you've probably seen this before. It's got the counter. Um, it's got this uh, fetch data. And here's some stuff that's specific to Fotino. These are some things that uh, actually have to do with the window frame itself. So as you can see, I'm uh, looking at my screen properties. So I'm looking at the properties of the window that's holding the browser control. So again, there's communication between your back end and here. So we can see the DPI. We can see which monitor we're on. Uh, we can see and set the width and height. Um, so I can bring this down and you can see the window moving. So that works in both directions. Um, I can say that the window's not resizable anymore. So there's my content, there's my Blazor app, my 
uh, it could be JavaScript, uh, and it's saying to the back end, hey, uh, make that window that you created that I'm sitting in, me being the browser control, not resizable anymore. And we pass that message to uh, the control, the Fotino, and Fotino says, oh yeah, that's a Windows thing, you know, it's a property. Um, or, hey, I'm on a Mac. So on a Mac, there's, you know, a different setting in the OS that says it's not resizable anymore. Uh, we can make it a topmost window. So now I can't switch and, and bring anything else up on top of it. Uh, I can't take another window and, you know, here's my uh, Teams window, for example. Uh, and that's something that's available through the operating system. So this is desktop stuff being exposed and controlled by a web UI. So that's again, part of that communication between the, the two of them. So that's an example of a Blazor app. Then we thought, oh, what's another thing we can do? Um, well, we could do, uh, what if they want to do something and we haven't built out a way to do it yet? Um, so our communication mechanism is uh, maybe not able to do uh, everything we can do. Now we can, again, we can send, we can use that memory stream and we can send things to the back end and then we can on the back end interpret what was sent and decide what to do. Um, and we thought, well, you know, it'd be really cool Often in web applications, you make calls out to services. And uh, you may say, you know, I want to go track UPS package or whatever. So you make a REST call or you make a gRPC call, um, you know, the new Google RPC uh, um, web API call. And, you know, we do this all the time and there's a built in mechanism for it. So, uh, you know, we can make, uh, say, REST calls. We just use, you know, the AJAX stuff that's been built into JavaScript for years. We can use, um, you know, reactive. Uh, we can make promises, all that good stuff that, that we've done for a long time. What if we take that web API or the gRPC and we build that into the back end? So our console app is now basically a web server and it's going to handle calls from the local machine um, and we can decide if only the local machine uh, can send things or we can decide if we want to take you know calls from other machines on the network even and we're going to let the UI make a call through web API or gRPC or you know whatever uh, system you want and we're going to have that work, um, you know, so that you can make calls into your .NET 5 and do anything you want in a standard way, a way that you're used to. And so in this case, I've added gRPC support. Now, gRPC support is not the easiest thing in the world for web yet. Um, JavaScript doesn't support it natively, so you need to download some node packages so that you can do web gRPC. Uh, but it's, you know, it's... This is a more difficult example than just doing web API, which is pretty easy. Um, but I'll show you the code behind this as well. So here's our gRPC enabled window and there's our, you know, same super call that we had before. And you can see in the background that I've been dumping stuff out to the command window in the background. And one of the things that I've been uh, dumping out here are some diagnostics. So um, if you've done any gRPC stuff, you'll find that there's some, you know, there's a greeter service that's sort of a hello world type of uh, interaction and it has a say hello method on it. So I've just set this up very basic that when this window comes up, it not only shows that message box through JavaScript, but it also makes a gRPC call. And you can see here that it's actually calling gRPC. It's getting a 204 response uh, in uh, 37 milliseconds. Uh, gRPC is a very fast uh, interaction. You can do the same thing without gRPC. You can just use straight web API. But you can see this call on localhost and uh, it, it gets a 200 and 
uh, again in 58 milliseconds it goes ahead and responds to the call. So uh, that's an example of making a call and, and the output is right here. I haven't actually got it outputting anything back to the UI anymore, uh, but you can see that the call is happening. Uh, here's my you know, uh, message that I had before. So this is the same example, but I just added GPRC as another way to communicate with the back end. Um, so it's not just, well, I have to send something to a memory stream and decide what I want to do with it uh, on the back end. It's, uh, you know, hey, I'm just going to do this like I do everything else. I'm going to set up the back end to handle services and, you know, those services are going to work. Um, I've had questions about navigation and things like that. If we look at the source code for this page, Uh, you'll see that, um, let's see, here is the anchor tag um, for page two, so it's just an href, so it's just like any other HTML, and I can go to page two. Now, I haven't put a return button on there, but uh, I can right-click, and I still have access, so uh, you can do all your navigation to different pages. Again, it's just all straight HTML stuff. There's nothing really uh, interesting. You'll see as I um, go to page two and then go back, because I had it set up that every time I navigate to that page, sort of the initialization of the page, um, I fire off my gRPC call. So you'll see in that command window that when I go back to the uh, first page, I get my super, which is sort of, you know, the, what we had shown before. This is when the page initializes. And then you'll see another um, request come through. So that's just showing these different communication mechanisms that, uh, that we have available to us. So at this point, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. I'm going to pull up the uh, slide deck here again. Um, and uh, the exam the samples will be available. I will show you the uh, uh, the code that I used to do the gRPC uh, in the samples. Let me get back to let's see what is that shift f five? Yeah. Um, and as you're uh, sending your questions in, I'm just going to let you know what's coming up. Uh, that native menu that we saw on Electron that's down the left side, um, that's part of the window. It's not part of the browser control. Um, and we want to add one of those uh, and give you the ability to use it or not, depending on how you want to build your app. Um, In-app updates, because all of the app contents are really, you know, they can be distributed as loose files. They can be distributed as um, resources. So you could compile them all into a DLL and put them in. So we'll give you some options for updating just the contents of the app. Um, and then uh, a different kind of update where if we're actually updating the uh, the shell itself. So what you, you know, what was your NuGet package? Um, <clears throat> if we uh, want to update that for, say, .NET 6 or to get a new feature that's available in it, um, we'll be able to actually update their version of Fotino.net uh, with a restart. So uh, a couple of really cool updates that where you don't have to worry about how the update works uh, or if you want to update your, you know, your .NET code. Um, and, you know, that's just all going to be handled and it, it'll be handled just like uh, you get updates for Teams or, you know, Visual Studio Code. You can either say, oh, there's an update. Do you want to install it? Or you can download it in the background when you find one. Um, so all that will be available. Uh, we want to make it available so you can do things like set the application icon. We're adding a lot more documentation. We'd like to add crash reporting so that it just automatically sends the information back to you. Uh, 